participants. Welcome back and thank you very much for those who are here with us for our last session of the day, which is the National Digital Skills Frameworks for Policy Making session. I would like to invite our dear panelists and our moderator on stage to start by taking a group photo and then start the session. Let's please welcome all our panelists and Ms. Susan Telcher as well, Head of Capacity and Digital Skills Development, ITU, who's going to introduce our, moderate, our panelists. Please join us on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. So, and uh, welcome to this uh, last session of the day. The day went by very quickly on national digital skills frameworks for policy making. In this session today, we will be looking specifically at what policymakers can do in order to include the dimension of digital skills into their national digital transformation strategies and plans. Because this requires um, knowledge about the demand and supply for digital skills in the countries, but it also requires information and data on current and future digital skills gaps. We already heard a little bit about this earlier, so in this session we are going to dive a little bit deeper into those issues. But how do you get all this information uh, from a policymaker point of view? And these kind of questions we will address during the course of this session. So the way we will organize the session is in, in three parts, let's say. Uh, first, we will present you with more details on the ITU Digital Skills Toolkit which was uh, officially launched this morning by the BDT director and, um, and where we want to know more on what is actually in the toolkit. After this um, presentation of the toolkit, we will be hearing from two experts on how they went about to assess national digital skills gaps and how to measure digital skills at the country level. And then after that, depending on how much time we have left, we will open the floor for questions and answers. So please be ready for that part later on. And we have a distinguished panel with us. I'm very happy, of course, that uh, Dr. Cosma Savazava is with us uh, at the beginning of the session to present the introduce the toolkit, the director of the Telecommunication Development Bureau. And then we have uh, three distinguished panelists with us. Mr. Chris Coward, who is the senior principal research scientist and affiliate associate professor at the University of Washington in the US. Welcome. We have um, Dr. Amnesty Lefebvre. She's associate professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Welcome, Amnesty. And we have Mr. Elno Mamadli, who is Director of the Executive Office and Digital and Business Transformation Department of the Innovation and Digital Development Agency under the Ministry 
of Digital Development and Transport in Azerbaijan. Welcome to the panel. So let us now turn to the ITU Digital Skills Toolkit. And it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Zavazava to deliver introductory remarks on the Digital Skills Toolkit. Please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you are remaining in the room? <laughs> you are the unsung heroes. Welcome back. It is nice to see you here. I think this session is of great importance for some of you who had the privilege of being part of the Global Symposium for Regulators that we held in Kampala, Uganda. You know that we ended the, the event with uh, regulatory guidelines which seek to support regulators in their decision making. Likewise, at this event, and I'm pleased that we have the authors of our digital skills toolkit. I once lived in a country where they had a proverb which goes, spoken word flies and the written word remains. So I think we need, despite the fact that we talk, we meet, exchange ideas, if something is not documented, you don't have a resource to go by. And therefore, it is a great pleasure that we are here to discuss a very important subject. I'm going to be very brief. Excellencies, our valuable participants from all over the world, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to open this session on national digital skills frameworks for policy making, focusing on the ITU Digital Skills Toolkit, which was launched earlier this morning. This morning, we heard from our high-level dignitaries about the paramount importance of closing the digital skills gap. If we are to foster true digital transformation, all of you participating in this forum hold the key to closing that gap. By developing robust digital skills strategies, together with other critical partners and stakeholders, and thus unlocking your respective nation's potential. The digital skills our citizens need to continue to grow in number and complexity, which means countries need to keep tracking digital skills levels. ITU is well known for collecting and then analyzing data. So next week we are going to have the World Telecommunications Indicator Symposium in Geneva. We are respected because we are part of the family of the United Nations Statistical Commission. We work with many of the other UN agencies. If we are to track the progress we are making towards the true establishment of an information society, we have to measure it. It can't exist without us knowing where we stand and what policy decisions have got to inform the investors when they invest, the policy formulation and the regulatory framework. So it is very important for us to track also the gaps in terms of skills, because without it, we will be going nowhere. We need to identify gaps as they emerge in order to develop effective policies to address them. The key to aligning efforts across various sectors is a comprehensive national policy framework which ensures a coordinated approach to digital skills development. It allows governments to set clear objectives, define standards, and allocate resources effectively. By establishing such framework, Countries can create a sustainable and scalable model for digital skills, education, and training, one that is responsive to the dynamic nature of technological progress. The ITU Digital Skills Toolkit offers a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide to help you craft effective national digital skills strategies and policies. This hands-on resource is filled with practical examples and actionable insights making it an invaluable asset for policymakers in all countries. 
I urge you all to make use of this toolkit. Those countries that make the most of it will not only be prepared for the digital future we want, but will become leaders in the digital age. The toolkit is designed for use by policymakers and other stakeholders, such as partners in the private sector, non-government organizations, and academia. It builds on the previous edition published in 2018, but following numerous requests from member states, it has been thoroughly reviewed and updated. And it now reflects the recent advances related to digital transformation and related skills requirements. The new toolkit, as I conclude, can be used in tandem with the ITU Digital Skills Assessment Guideline or a guidebook published in 2020, which helps policymakers identify national skills gaps. The results of such a digital skills assessment exercise can then inform the national policy and making process along with the insights, tools, and guidance now provided by the ITU Digital Skills Toolkit. I hope the toolkit will be a game changer for you all on your journey to bridge the digital skills gap. And with this, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zavazava, for um, these uh, introductory remarks. And um, we are now turning to the uh, presentation on the Digital Skills Toolkit itself. And it's my great pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Chris Coward, who is actually the lead author of the Digital Skills Toolkit. So we are very glad to have him here uh, with us today. And he will give you an overview of what the toolkit entails and how it can be used by policymakers and other stakeholders. Chris, the floor is yours. You have the clicker. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to be here and, and really for the opportunity uh, to contribute to this uh, project. So a little background. Uh, the first edition of this report was published in 2018, and a lot has happened since then, right? New technologies, new workforce needs, new sectors, and as a result, there was requests from the ITU membership that we needed an updated version, something that reflected the current situation, our current environment. There are new technologies, there are new opportunities, and there are new risks. And so they wanted a, a, a new version that would um, accommodate this. So the request came in, and then the ITU group on capacity building, let's see what happened here. Yeah. Capacity building initiatives uh, took the initial step of providing new scoping and direction for the development of the 2024 edition of the toolkit. The objective is quite simple. It's to provide a very concise step-by-step -step, step set of guidance for policymakers to develop a national digital skills strategy. Uh, it's intended to have clear steps and associated worksheets with those steps. And it has examples drawn from around the world. Uh, so in one sense, it's kind of a horizontal look. It's an overview of all the steps needed with examples provided to, for inspiration and for models of what countries can do. The audience are policymakers, and importantly, it's not only for countries without a national strategy, it's for countries with national strategies as well. Uh, because if it was developed two years ago or three years ago, again, things have changed. There are new examples from around the world that can, be off <clears throat> that can provide inspiration uh, for refreshing those strategies. So this has been gone over several times in this uh, forum. This is just one indicator of the necessity for digital skills strategy. And this is, of course, just the tip of the iceberg and only really represents the economic dimension 
of the challenge and the opportunity. But as has been underscored, this is a more comprehensive set of needs for digital skills. The economic one is just one. There's the social inclusion, and the previous panel had many stories of the different uh, strategies and programs that have been undertaken for social inclusion. Something that hasn't been mentioned as much is civic engagement. We know what can happen in our, for our civil societies when there's a healthy uh, democratic participation and people with digital skills to participate health, in a healthy way online. We've seen in the US where I'm from what can happen when misinformation and other forms of digital harms can erode public trust in institutions and in each other. I'm sorry? There's a screen here. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and then, of course, a strategy is useful for uh, taking account of technological change, AI, of course, and whatever is next. So AI, again, it's been mentioned already, and particularly generative AI, it's already becoming quite commonplace in workforce, in workplaces around the world. And so we need to update our digital skills training so that people can use AI effectively. I haven't seen it yet, but I suspect we will also see AI applications that can help with digital skills training. That would be an important project. And as many people know, this is an area where the future is unknown and it is very contested and debated. And as was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, by His Excellency and by uh, Dr. Zava Zava. We need people who are going to be equipped to use these technologies ethically and responsibly. The toolkit emphasizes the importance of using a framework. Frameworks are important for standardization, so there's a common language of what is being, uh, what's entailed in, in digital skills. Uh, for providing guidance, not just to policymakers, but also curriculum developers and others. For developing, for people to identify those areas where they need to develop their sk skills further. And for assessment, so we can know whether we're making progress. The example here is from the European Digital Competency Framework, or DigCOMP, and it's a well-known one. It's not the only one. We do recommend that countries look at these what I would call a holistic framework. There are also other frameworks that are more uh, instrumental, that take a very kind of very technology-centric approach uh, and are maybe just for completing certain tasks. This one takes a more holistic approach, which I think is important given that we're talking about a whole of society issue here with digital skills. There's a roadmap. The roadmap roughly equates with the chapters in the toolkit. Uh, there's a set of activities for getting ready, a phase where we can build on existing work that's being done in all countries. I believe every country has done some work, some more than others, and there's important insights that can be gleaned from that work. There's, the, of course, the creation of the plan itself, and then there's the implementation, because of course implement, a plan is only as good as it is acted upon. So for the first part, I'll just dive in a little bit deeper on what each of these uh, chapters contain. The first question is, what is the state of a country's digital skills strategies? This might be at the national level. There might be a national strategy. Some countries have national strategies. It might be at the ministerial level, and I would say most countries have ministerial level programs or strategies, whether it be in education, rural development, healthcare. These are all strategies that are already existing and need to be identified, assessed, and looked at to see what are the opportunities and priorities for moving forward. That's on the supply side. Then on the demand side, or the, the, this, this, the state of the citizens, what is the level of digital skills in the country? 
This is important, of course, because we want to know whether we're making progress. So we need to establish baselines and benchmarks. We need to identify those underserved communities. Again, the previous panel talked about that extensively. We also need to assess our infrastructure, both our physical, digital, and human infrastructure, and whether it is up to the task of delivering digital skills training. And we need to assess where is our major workforce sectors in the country and what are their needs for digital skills and how does the level of digital skills compare with what is required in the workforce. So we represent looking at our existing data, of course, conducting a general population survey if possible, and targeted studies where there are areas of high priority. This forum also underscores the importance of having a broad range of stakeholders at the table. We've had members of civil society, the IT industry, educational institutions, and others. Just as this is a whole of society problem, it requires members from all of society to be at the table when developing a strategy of this sort. Again, we provide examples. The one that comes to mind was in South Africa and where they have a, a, a digital skills forum, I believe it's called, that has a good maybe 30 representatives from a cross sector of society. We've simplified this into digital skills for life and digital skills for work. Rather than, I think, what was more, used to be more conventional of beginning, intermediate, advanced, we decided to focus on the use case and who, the users. So for all or for all citizens, and as again, this has been mentioned throughout, that all citizens require and deserve the opportunity to participate fully in the digital society. And let's not forget, it's also to have fun and have leisure and play games. And I do think games was mentioned once. Very important in this strategy, beyond primary and secondary education, is lifelong learning. Because of technology changes, and we can't leave our grandparents behind, um, we need to have those opportunities, whether they be at public libraries, community-based organizations, or others, to ensure that these venues exist for people at any stage of their life to get, to get more uh, knowledge about digital skills. And of course, this is the only way that we can ensure that we are reaching the populations in greatest need. Digital skills for work, the other category, big category, um, is for those more advanced skills. But let's also divide this into different categories. Again, instead of beginning, intermediate, advanced, we have a different take. General work-related skills, those are the skills that probably most of you and most of us in this room use, being able to use the internet, use our productivity applications for our day-to-day -day jobs in office environments. On the other end of the spectrum are the advanced skills, the programmers, the coders, the database managers, cybersecurity experts. That's also fairly clear cut um, and an obvious need. In the middle are domain-specific skills. This is a category where we had that question earlier or that statement earlier about how farmers don't need to know everything. They don't, uh, they don't need to you know, know how to use word processing, but they do need to know how to access market information, uh, maybe send information about a crop to a local um, agricultural specialist who can diagnose a disease or perform other specific tasks related to that person's profession. It could be in health administration, it could be a merchant, and these domain-specific skills are often becoming easier to identify and train for. Lastly, on implementation, the toolkit it, uh, summarizes this. There's obviously a whole, every country is gonna have its own implementation mechanisms. For digital skills, we just want to call attention to a couple of important considerations. First is to have that oversight committee ideally representing that, that, the, the broad stakeholder group that was mentioned earlier. There's also that need to measure impact, again, very critical. And lastly, 
Oh, thirdly, this is because of the, the pace of change, it's important to update these strategies frequently, whatever that word means, but certainly every three to four years. And lastly, because of all the changes and the insights that can be gained, there's no replacing of forums and conferences and venues like this where people can exchange knowledge, hear the stories from others about what's working in their own uh, situations. That's extremely critical for staying abreast of technological change. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, uh, for giving us these, um, these great insights into the new Digital Skills Toolkit. Um, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, the toolkit is available on the ITU website. So please go and visit. It's, uh, it was posted uh, today. And you can uh, use it for your um, applications in your countries. And uh, please also give us feedback. We are also very interested always in hearing um, about the uh, usage of our, of our um, uh, toolkits and guidances. So uh, thank you very much for those insights. And uh, we are now going to move from the uh, presentation of the framework, the toolkit, to here some concrete cases uh, from uh, two of our um, experts who are here with us, who have been working on different aspects that are also covered in this toolkit. Uh, the first um, speaker, next speaker will be Dr. Amnesty uh, Lefebvre. So Amnesty will focus on aspects of uh, skills assessment and skills measurement. And uh, you saw that this was an important part um, in pre preparing for the roadmap of a national digital skills uh, strategy and highlighted in the, in the toolkit. She will pick up on some of the frameworks that are also included in the toolkit and show you how those frameworks can be applied and adjusted in uh, a developing country and low income country context. So Amnesty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Susan and esteemed colleagues, uh, for the opportunity to be here today. Um, for my presentation today, I'm hoping to touch on three key points. First, I'd like to make the case as to why we need digital skills data. I'll argue that these data are essential for monitoring trends in technology use, particularly for women. Second, we need greater standardization in our approach to measuring digital skills. And finally, I'll close with a suggestion for greater investment in generating digital skills data. Starting first with our first key message, I'd like to talk more about why we need digital skills data. Data help us monitor trends in digital access and use, and a troubling trend is emerging, particularly in low and middle income countries. And that is, with increasing digitization, women are being left behind. Data from the GSMA's consumer survey suggests that women are 8% less likely than men to own a mobile phone. The quality of women's phones is poorer, with women being 13% less likely than men to have a smartphone. Women's use of mobile phones is also more limited. When it comes to internet use, data suggests that women are 15% less likely than men to use the mobile internet. What we also know from available data is that the digital skills are a leading barrier to technology use. In this slide, we present data from the GSMA's consumer survey again, showing the top three uh, barriers to technology use for women on the left column and men on the right. And you'll see that digital skills fall in the top three for both. Beyond helping us understand differentials in access to and use of digital solutions, data on digital skills can provide important insights into the role technology plays in catalyzing women's and girls' access to education, health education and services, and income generating opportunities. Data are also important for monitoring progress towards SDGs 4.4.1 and 4.4.2. Yet despite the need for these data, 
Very few low and middle income countries collect population level digital skills data. This slide highlights the 40 low and middle income countries where UNICEF's multiple indicator cluster survey has collected digital skills questions since 2019. The absence of data for a greater number of countries hampers efforts to bridge gaps and exacerbates existing inequalities in, developing, in development outcomes. Now that we've made a case for why we need digital skills data, I'd like to talk about how we approach digital skills measurement. There are three central challenges to measurement. The first is that measurement has historically focused on computer skills when most low and middle income country populations use mobile phones. If we look again at UNICEF's multiple indicator cluster survey, we see that upwards of 75% of the population gets excluded because in the last iteration of the survey, they focused measurement only on digital skills amongst computer users. And this, at a population level, amounts to less than 10% of the total population. The second challenge is that there is no consensus on which digital skills to prioritize. While competency frameworks give us a framework for thinking about skills, we need guidance on which skills to prioritize. Finally, there are varied approaches to measuring skills. Critically, there's no one core set of questions which countries can adapt and use to their context. Digital skills surveys themselves have further been implemented in different ways. For example, many of European surveys are self-administered, while UNICEF's mixed data are collected through a structured survey facilitated by a data collector. Finally, there are varied approaches to analyzing skills data. The ITU has standards for skill levels. Others present data as an overall composite score. With these challenges in mind, I want to take a step back and think about how we should standardize the measurement of digital skills. In this next slide, I present six basic steps for thinking about this. Let me walk you through each of these very quickly. We start first with item generation. What do I mean by this? This is basically concerned with determining what it is that you want to measure. For this, thankfully, we have the benefit of the Digital Competence Framework for Citizens, which Chris kindly introduced us to. And this framework outlines five competence areas within which skills can be measured. This framework was established in 2013 and has matured over time with inputs from expert working groups and with the benefit of evidence generation from a range of contexts. So how do we practically go from a conceptual framework to skills questions? This is the central challenge that we face. One approach recommended by the ITU is to start by measuring their ICT skills indicator. In this slide, we show how the competence area is recommended for measurement. Um, we show how competence areas recommended for measurement fall within each of these competence domains to comprise this indicator. We're then able to generate survey questions which can be used to measure digital skills associated with each of these components of the competence framework. Moving along to our next step, with draft questions in hand, we then sought to refine the wording and translations of these questions for use in a range of contexts. We achieved this through a process called cognitive interviewing. Cognitive interviewing is a qualitative research method um, used to understand how respondents in divergent settings and from different backgrounds interpret draft survey questions. And then we essentially iteratively revise how those questions are phrased and how they're translated to ensure that they're capturing the intended meaning. All too often, this crucial step is missed. In this next slide, we've summarized learnings from conducting cognitive interviews in Kenya, Nigeria, and India to improve digital skills questions. Because of time limitations, I won't get too much into the details here, but just to say that we've developed recommendations in terms of general principles for measurement, which are highlighted in yellow, and digital skills-specific recommendations. And these are available in separate peer review publications, and in larger toolkits that focus on measurement that the Gates Foundation has funded and have been produced by UCT and Johns Hopkins. Um, if you're interested, we'll provide a link to these um, on the website. Moving back to our six-step approach, 
I want to mention that we followed qualitative research in a range of settings now with more quantitative work. So this includes two things. The first is A-B testing to test different ways of asking the same question and measuring different constructs. And then further reliability testing to look at the modality of how we implement surveys. So this includes observations of skills versus relying on reported practice. It also includes different ways and modalities of administering surveys. For example, self-administered surveys versus surveys facilitated by enumerators. If we move towards our, towards our last step of data analysis, it's here that we'll try to analyze digital skills data in a range of ways. Oops, sorry, let me take us forward. In a range of ways. Um, this includes creating a scale and estimating different levels of digital skills. And it's here the ITU defines basic digital skills based on an individual's ability to perform at least one activity in each competency area. I want to close my talk with a final slide advocating for more investment in primary data collection. As we've established, we need more robust, frequent data on digital skills. To support this, we need a model questionnaire and guidance to support the implementation of that questionnaire. This needs to be complemented by support to governments in low resource settings in particular, both in terms of funding for primary research and in building capacity to local institutions for the collection of this data. This includes national sample statistics offices. Um, I'll close with a final slide just in noting that this work um, was, um, was benefited tremendously from our research teams in a range of settings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amnesty, for this uh, great presentation and your insights on how to measure the digital skills uh, of the population. Uh, collecting data on digital skills is a key uh, input uh, when you prepare your national digital skills framework. So we are trying to link um, the overall framework that was presented by uh, Chris earlier in the roadmap to different elements that are a key input into that, um, into that roadmap. And at the beginning, to assess what is going on in your country, where do you stand in terms of levels of digital skills, and how do you actually assess and measure that? So this is a great contribution uh, that you are working on in uh, showing uh, how this can be done and what are some of the challenges. And also, thank you for highlighting the work of ITU. As was mentioned earlier by the VDT director, we have a lot of work going on in this field. And next week in Geneva, there will be a meeting um, of the statistical community to look into um, uh, ICT data and digital skills measurement is part of that uh, group as well. So thank you again uh, for that. So now let me uh, move to our next uh, distinguished uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Elnu Mamadli. He will share with us the process that was followed in Azerbaijan when undertaking a national digital skills assessment. So, Elna, we look forward to hearing more about it. Thank you very much. Uh, I will actually tell about the experience of Azerbaijan uh, in digital skills assessment. The uh, previous one um, will be shown in a use case format. So, uh, in 2023, the Ministry of Digital Development and Transport of Azerbaijan initiated uh, a collaborative effort under the supervision of the ITU Regional Office for CIS and the ICT Data Statistics Division to assess digital skills and identify the country's current level of digital literacy and um, persisting digital skills gaps. And this uh, work and assessment was discussed, organized, and coordinated on the basis of ITU's Digital Skills Assessment Guidebook 2020 released version. Key stakeholders were uh, the Ministry of Digital Development and Transport, the State Statistical Committee of Republic of Azerbaijan, and International Communication Union. 
Uh, I want to tell about the link between this assessment and digital strategy policy in our country. We have um, Azerbaijan 2030 national priorities on uh, social economic development, and one of the priorities is uh, competitive human capital and innovation. And what does it mean in practice? It means that government bodies should prioritize their portfolios, projects, in order to understand how, in more efficient way, reorganize the projects in order to achieve their strategic goal. Uh, the interesting part of that is um, that the result of our assessment uh, has shown that there is no clear um, cause and effect relationship between the increment of household with mobile secular network and uh, the digital skills. And also there is no clear uh, cause and effect relationship between household internet penetration and digital skills increase, uh, increment. Um, the strategy was uh, about ICT roadmap. Today we can recall it as a digital skills strategy. Was initiated from 2016, so bases were in place, and the uh, basic work, foundational work, has started since 2016. Um, when questionnaires and um, assessment starts, the um, process was uh, done in the framework of this guidebook, as we said, and there are five skill areas in this uh, framework. It is information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital uh, content creation, problem solving and safety. So it's very important to understand what do we mean when we say digital skills? And it will help you to understand what is the meaning of our insights from our um, statistical results. So methodology has described, uh, I, I think, by previous speakers too, but you can read or take a photo of that in order to understand what specifically means each a knowledge area and how we have measured it. Uh, so survey data was uh, in representative groups in different regions and social groups. Uh, for instance, students, 70%, 12% uh, staff of private enterprises, 10% is uh, teaching staff in uh, higher education institutions, and of course, public agencies. And the results were, uh, in some cases, very expected, uh, but it was uh, an empiric evidence of intuitively obvious um, information. For instance, uh, it was very interesting to understand that um, more men have above basic skills, 10%, compared to women, 6% for 25% um, of Azerbaijanis aged 15, 74 have at least basic digital skills. And when we say digital skills, uh, you should go to the activity list and understand what this means specifically. Um, let's talk about distribution of individuals by digital skill areas. Um, the most important part for us is that for Azerbaijan, Nice, uh, aged 1574, uh, the most important skills um, that are lagging are safety, digital content creation, and problem solving in the digital context, of course. Uh, and the obvious, as I said previously, uh, insight was that the more educated you are, the more uh, higher educational level you have, the more digitally skilled you are, and that is, uh, has shown it uh, empirically. Uh, let's go to the challenges in digital skills assessment, uh, because I think it's uh, more useful for the countries that are planning to conduct such assessment in their countries. Challenges in data collection and even regional participation 
is the first challenge. The second challenge is uh, in measuring skill levels, because this approach includes only self-reporting, and the digital skills assessment primarily relied on self-reporting, which could lead to uh, inaccuracies due to over or underestimation of individual competences. The fourth challenge is targeting vulnerable groups, and uh, another is challenges in comparison. Key lessons learned from digital skills assessments are, uh, the first is the need for representative sampling. The second is self-reporting data limitations. I want to highlight it because reliance on self-reported surveys can lead to over and underestimation of digital skills. Self-reports introduce bias. Integrating observation uh, or performance-based assessment could offer more accurate results. Of course, we understand that performance-based results in such a huge assessment would be very costly, but it is how can be increased uh, the accuracy of the data. And the fourth lesson is addressing skill gaps in vulnerable groups. And recommendations, if we could do so, is to use and include a variety of skill levels. Uh, by this, I mean the assessment should cover both basic and advanced digital skills, in our opinion, uh, tar target vulnerable groups, and combine self-reported data with performance-based assessments and involve multiply stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mamadli, for this excellent uh, presentation. And uh, congratulations on the work that you did in Azerbaijan on uh, measuring digital skills. It was also a pleasure for ITU to collaborate um, with uh, your ministry on this exercise. Uh, so it's a, it's a good example also of collaboration. And um, I'm also very happy to, to see a, a, an example of how the Digital Skills Assessment Guidebook, which w was used for that, uh, which, as was mentioned earlier, complements the Digital Skills Toolkit, uh, because the assessment is one of the elements in uh, developing a digital skills uh, roadmap. And, um, and maybe just to, to add, uh, both of the presentations that, that we have heard now were looking at the uh, assessing or measuring the supply side, what we call in terms of the digital skills, because they were looking at citizens' uh, skills. In the assessment, um, which is part of a digital skills strategy and also in our assessment guidebook, we are focusing on both the supply and the demand side because when you assess your, if you want to find out about your skills gap in the country, you also need to look into the demand side. And we talked about the, um, the demand from the um, industry side, for example, on digital skills. So there are other exercises that you can do to also assess the demand in terms of uh, where are you going in the future, which are the growth industries in the future, and what kind of skills are needed uh, for that. So just to complement a little bit what we have looked at here now. So um, let me look at the watch. We have a little bit of time. Uh, just. Uh, in case uh, I'm looking now at the audience, I can already see one hand over there. So um, let me invite you, please, uh, if you could briefly introduce uh, yourself and uh, then raise your question. If it's to somebody specific, then please also say so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nosi Posiklata. I'm from South Africa. Um, in the Ministry of Communications and Digital Technologies. Um, for, for us, I think this uh, digital skills toolkit, um, firstly, it comes at a very important time when we are looking at reviewing our digital and future skills strategy, which we had uh, published in 2020, taking guidance from the uh, 2018 uh, toolkit. So this is quite an opportune time for us to receive the um, updated you know, toolkit because we are going to use it as a basis for our, again, our, the, the reviewing of our strategy. 
And what we have noticed uh, when we talk around the demand and the supply side um, was the issue of matching supply and demand because the, there was such a, the digital skills strategy provided a very good um, platform you know, for uptake of digital skills development in the country. And there was uh, so much traction in terms of the supply side. Whilst we acknowledge that um, digital skills um, provide a good opportunity into the, into the labor market, but what we have noticed was the, there was an element of unemployability, you know, although there has been a lot of digital skills development, but there was also, you know, um, on the demand side, we noticed that there is an issue of employability, which um, tends to affect, you know, how we address the issue of unemployment, um, unemployment in the country. So we would like to really um, get some expertise in terms of how best do we address that. And also we have um, used the toolkit and our development of the strategy to develop, uh, to establish a digital skills forum, which we have seen as a very good platform to provide digital leadership uh, and also bring together the digital uh, skills development ecosystem. I think that one it has it really helped um, the country. So as, as part of the question, especially when it comes to the measurement that was um, uh, presented, we would like to really um, uh, get insights into, into how best to, to conduct a deep dive analysis into the demand side, because that's where we have noticed uh, that we are you know, not able to really understand what is it that needs to happen to see more and more, especially the young people, uh, getting into the labor market. Um, we note the challenges that have been presented insofar as the assessment, uh, assessment of digital skills, because that's also another area that we are currently uh, undertaking to, un to take some impact assessment before we do the review of the strategy in 2025. So again, insight on that, um, on those challenges are going to help us as we um, look into to, to the assessment and impact you know, of uh, the digital skills strategy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and um, congratulations on the work also done in South Africa in looking into the um, measurement and also uh, the assessment of the digital skills at the national level. I'm just looking in case there's any other question before, okay, let me, I'm gonna take a handful of questions and then we have one round for everybody to, to answer. You can pick which question, but I can see a few hands in the back. Um, okay, <laughs> I'll start from the back, uh, very end there, the white shirt. Uh, yes, please. Hello, hello, yep. Um, I'm Professor Ashok Jashapara from University of London. Uh, first, I want to just thank the uh, whole panel for a really inspiring uh, presentation. Um, one of the things that came up, oh, one of the things about being right at the back, you feel like a, an old school kid of being back of the class. But um, one of the things that reminded me a lot about what um, you've talked about in terms of the digital skills framework is really thinking about nowadays people talk about the digital economy, but just 10 years ago, people were talking about the knowledge economy. And some of you may remember that a lot of organizations were into trying to measure their intellectual capital. And they were going through the same angst and issues about how do we measure customer capital, uh, human capital, social capital, uh, organizational capital, and so on. And I almost get the sense that, uh, for example, the last speaker was um, talking about digital class skills classification. But because the technology is changing so quickly and so much, my real thoughts were about what happens when those skills itself changes quite dramatically and how will 
the framework respond to it? Because I know uh, uh, Chris, right at the beginning, he was saying that these strategies would be updated every three or four years. But the technology is just changing so fast. So, so the initial question was about how do we do that? My second, more important uh, uh, observation is around saying, yes, we develop these fantastic frameworks, um, but what people are interested in is what is their impact? What is the outcomes of that? Is it, as the last uh, person uh, in the audience just asked, is it going to increase unemployment? Is it going to uh, increase more jobs? Uh, what real impact is this going to have? And for particularly um, uh, the last panelist with the use case of Azerbaijan, I'd be interested if they've taken that further to say, what's it actually doing within the country if they've got data from a few years? I was also wondering how you bring context in, particularly if you're looking at a large number of countries from low and uh, middle uh, GDP countries of saying, context for each of those countries is going to be so different. So as Amnesty was saying, that they use a lot of qualitative data of saying, how do you bring that qualitative data within these digital skills framework? How do you just purely have one framework that will be satisfy a lot of these countries? So some, some room for, for thought there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ashok. I think you are in one of the panels tomorrow, so we also look forward to he hearing on that. I think there were two other hands. Yes, please, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you. First and foremost, congratulations for having this uh, <coughs> framework. But my question is uh, related to now. We talk about the uh, digital skills. Uh, as uh, our panelists from Azerbaijan talk about one of the uh, priorities is, is on innovations. But I think this is the other area in which when we talk about, I don't know, with, within this framework, under the uh, problem solving, it's just problem solving. But I think what makes human uh, develop is through uh, innovations. But probably that these are areas in which when, uh, it's not a question uh, the professor from uh, <coughs> asked about the uh, knowledge economy, digital economy, but that lies in uh, intellectual capitals. So I think this is another area of, uh, I, I'm not too sure whether the, within the framework is there, but we need to have more conversations on innovations related to the uh, digital I, uh, skills framework because the conversations talk about employ, uh, question of unemployability, but it's not just about uh, job creations, it's about also creating jobs. So this, these are probably areas in which um, we can work on. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Was there another question? I saw some other hand. Yes. Over to you, please. Uh, can you please briefly introduce yourself at the beginning? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Minwal van der Laar from the United Nations University Merit. I have uh, two quick questions. First one is, um, if we uh, consider digital skills as a contextually determined, how, uh, in, how important is it to measure them using that context? And if so, how comparable would the outcomes still be? Is that important even? And secondly, do we consider these, uh, these measurements uh, an outcome on its own? So is the aim to increase digital skills or are we also using them as mediators to uh, solve some kind of a societal problem? And if the latter does measurement then matter even? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mindel. There's one, one last question, the gentleman over here, and then we go back to the panel, and you have, uh, each of you can address uh, the questions in your last uh, intervention. Over to the gentleman yeah. over there. Uh, thank you again uh, for the great presentations. Uh, Shegu from Nigeria here. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've been working on digital skills assessment in my organization. Uh, we've done now for five African countries. Uh, my question, I mean, majorly around Dr. Hamnes's presentation. Great presentation, by the way. Uh, you identified a key challenge, which is around standardization of survey questions. 
Uh, my question is, is that just an identified challenge or is it commitment to work on that? Is there a commitment, is there a roadmap to work on that standardization? Is something that's going to help a great deal. Uh, the second one, uh, when we are assessing digital skills, there's always a conflict between assessing knowledge and assessing skill sets. I mean, thank, yeah, you'll be very familiar with that. And I think for me, uh, one of the great arguments within these teams is, am I evaluating for what I, I think when it comes to knowledge, you can partly know, but when it comes to skill set, it's either you can or you cannot. That's always the prevailing argument. I mean, how do you balance that uh, need for measurement of knowledge and measurement of, uh, and measurement of skill sets, which, are, which tend to be more definite? My last question is around uh, assessment for data collection. I, I think in terms of uh, what's available to the in terms of technologies, uh, beyond just collecting data, are there efforts to develop programs that are informed by this data collected from assessment, such that uh, by the time uh, you are launching these programs, you can have programs that are personalized based on what the assessment result says? Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for these uh, great questions. I think. Uh, well, we, uh, let's say, two minutes each, uh, if possible, to have your final, uh, and let's try, and, and I, I'm not going to repeat the question, it will take too much time, I think you got them, so we will start with uh, Chris, please. These are really, really good uh, points and, and questions. Thank you for those questions. Um, I thought that first question around the kind of the supply and demand and the unemployability problem from South Africa was really uh, in interesting, particularly because South Africa has done such a, in my understanding, at least in my reading, a quite remarkable job of having a national vision, then using that vision to develop a strategy, and then from the strategy to guidelines and roadmaps, and really comprehensive, uh, and yet you still have this challenge, and that's, I think, instructive uh, for everybody. Um, all I can say, because I don't have the answers here, but it, it shows the importance of because this is moving, at, as someone said, at lightning speed, and when new technologies are far outpacing, outpacing our capacity to implement new curriculum, um, having those representations from industry associations, particularly as it relates to employability, chambers of commerce, uh, other organizations that have um, you know, keen, almost real-time information on kind of what are the employment trends and how can you take that back into course correcting some of the existing programs and launching new programs with industry uh, uh, as a partner. Um, I've seen many countries uh, who have looked at priority sectors and done really deep dive evaluations of those sectors, a very comprehensive studies that could look deeply at the needs of whether it was a microenterprise field or uh, healthcare, tourism, agriculture. I think those sector-based studies can, can give you a lot of insights beyond which, is which can be accomplished with kind of a general uh, population type of, uh, of, or general industry uh, type of data. So that would be my recommendation there. Um, kind of on the same thing about the notion of tur things turning. You know, I see I'm out of time. Um, I think the innovation, I agree, has to happen at the framework level. And that's one of the reasons that DigiComp is up to number 2.2 .2 at the moment. It started in 2013. That's our best attempt, or the, the field's best attempt, to try to accommodate these technological changes into a framework that can then be implemented whether it be in, in the delivery of digital skills training or in measurement. Um, so I think we need to continue to invest in that, uh, stay attuned to it, um, because it is a digital skills, is, as, as the professor said, it's not a uh, one, one and done activity, it's a nonstop activity uh, that we, I think some of the principles and processes of the toolkit are hopefully more durable and timeless, whereas the, where the technologies underneath them will indeed uh, change. Excellent, yes, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, over to you, Amnesty. Thank you so much, and um, thank you for such an insightful range of different questions. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to start by addressing my colleagues' questions from Nigeria and just um, say that we are trying to standardize the survey questions. So there have been a number of different consultations with key stakeholder groups. At present, it's very much been sort of one-to-one -one outreach with different organizations. And for example, we had a digital skills workshop that was funded by the Gates Foundation in London that brought colleagues from the ITU together with um, colleagues from UNICEF who run the multiple indicator cluster survey um, to get at a first conversation about how we might um, think about changing uh, wording around how survey questions are implemented and coming up with a core set of questionnaires. And then our own research has sought to build off of those conversations and collect primary data, bringing in the voices of um, individuals at a community level in a range of contexts. So there are some early efforts to standardize. We're hoping that we can put out a sort of a core questionnaire with additional support from, from the ITU and others. Um, beyond that, uh, just to my colleague from South Africa, I would echo Chris's sentiments in saying that really um, South Africa is a lighthouse very much in, in the region for a lot of the, the sort of national policy level frameworks that you referenced. But also at a, at a, from a gender perspective, South Africa uniquely um, has near gender parity in women's access to and use of technology. And a lot of the uh, sort of issues we talked around around access to smartphones, a lot of the gender differences we see in other contexts across South Asia, Pakistan, India, other places, um, fall away in South Africa. So I think there's tremendous, tremendous opportunity um, to sort of bring in kind of that demand side perspective. Um, to address some of the larger issues around unemployment. Um, again, I think it has to be demographic sector specific. We need to have a sort of population level estimate of where basic skills, and I use that term loosely, but a composite measure of where skills stand, and then a more targeted, segmented approach for assessing career-related competencies that allow us to marry you know, certain sectors with the skills that they need and identify the gaps so that you can then, you know, do bridging programs. Lots to say um, between us and cocktails, I realize, so let me hand it to my colleagues. Thank you, thank you very much. I will try to answer the question about why do we even need this assessment, what is the value, how this helps us to fight unemployment and how we can use it practically, not hypothetical, but in practice in Azerbaijan. Such kind of assessments are used in our, by our policymakers in order to justify investments in digital skills. So it's very important to uh, make data-driven decisions in our country. So when you um, justify your suggestions with data, then you can get the money investment, do projects. The second part is about the what part, in which areas should we focus on. Such kind of researches helps us at high level understand which skill gaps should be addressed first. But as you understand from our conversation, it's not so specific. So we have started to use so-called agile portfolio management approach where feedback is very important, and we talk with our students of our TechNest National Digital Skills Program. We, in the country level, in order to, fi to fight digital divide, uh, give free digital courses to people, regardless of their gender and age, and they get these digital skill courses. And this helps us to use pragmatically such assessments and schools and fight uh, unemployability. Why we can do that? Because KPI of these projects is not just increasement of skills, it's the outcome-based KPIs or OKRs about if the uh, participant will end your course, they should get the job within six months. Elsewhere, we will not continue to work with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we have come to the end of the session. I would like to uh, thank again everybody, the audience for the great questions, uh, the panelists for the excellent uh, contributions, and um, invite you all to, again, to check the new digital skills toolkit. 
also the assessment guidebook, which complements the toolkit. We have heard a lot of uh, applications of uh, these different um, of this, these different tools, and in the end, they provide you a general guidance. But then, when you go down to the country level, of course, you will adapt to your specific circum circumstances. And here, we can also engage in a conversation with you. Uh, if you need uh, further help uh, on any of these um, exercises that you are doing at the country level, please also get in touch with us and, and we, can, we can discuss that as well. And I think uh, just to close on the comment that was made on, on the outcome and uh, eventually, of course, what we, we are not measuring for the sake of measuring, we are not assessing for the sake of assessing, we are not developing a toolkit just for the sake of having it, but it is meant to feed into your uh, national um, digital skills uh, strategy, and the ultimate goal of that is, of course, to increase the level of digital skills at the, at the country level, and this is the ultimate goal, and uh, we need to then also see later whether that has been achieved after the implementation of these um, strategies and roadmaps. So let's give another round of applause for the um, panelists. Thank you so much. Uh, a cocktail, I think, is waiting, and I'm sure there will be more um, opportunities to follow up on with our panelists. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Susan, Dr. Cosmos, Mr. Crix, uh, Dr. Amnesty, and Mr. Al Noor for this session. And as, of course, as Susan said, we will be able to discuss some more in the cocktail reception. I'd like to invite all our participants to join us in the cocktail welcome reception, which is going to be in the garden that we were in this morning. And I'm sure that the weather will be much more pleasant now. So I hope that you all enjoy. I just want to remind you all that we will reconvene here tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. for the Digital Skills for Jobs session. And I just want to note that the shuttle bus schedule is available on the Digital Skills Forum website. The agenda is available there as well. And as for me, it's been a pleasure to be your host for today. I hope we see you all tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>